What's up, everyone? Welcome back for another edition of Live from Red Hook. We're here at the Function House. I'm Mike Gentile, along here with Anthony Vitali. And tonight's special guest is Lodato. Hello, everybody. What's up, my man? Thanks How are we doing? Down. Thank you. Welcome to the Function House. Happy to be here. We're happy to have you. How did you uh, get this name, Lodato? So basically, I started as DJSL. And I never really, like, something that was just like, it was... I was being called something else, you know what I mean? So then... SL, like SL600? No, like SL Saladato. Oh, all right. Oh, so it's your last it, name. It just so happened that it was like the technique. But so then um, my friend came up to me. He's like, yo, man, all these Euro guys have these cool names. Why, why are you SL? Like, it sounds American. I'm like, <laughs> all right, you know what? What do you think I should be called? He goes, bro, your last name. Like, it's in Euro, high school, it's everybody called you Lodato. And I was like, all right, you know what? Fuck it, I'll go with that. But meanwhile, DJSL was locking down the residencies in AC at Harris. <laughs> and this and that. And I'm like, oh, shit. Like, what am I going to do? How am I going to transition now in the middle of all this? Thinking at that time, oh, my God, this is so important. Yeah, yeah, You know, yeah, yeah. type of thing. And then I was like, all right, you know what? Who cares? You know? So you just did it. Just I just said, name. you know what? I'm doing it. But before that, I was like, all right, I need something to spice this up. So when I was in AC, I'm DJing, and this guy comes up to me. His name is Danny. He goes, uh, oh, I know your brother. You know, at the time, it was, you know, brother. Uh, Scribble. I'm like, oh, nice to meet you. He's like, oh, I'm from Dubai. He's like, uh, I want you to come out and uh, DJ in Dubai. I'm like, what? I'm like, come on, you, you, everybody met them. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Those type of guys. Oh, come out to here, play here. I'm like, all right, whatever. I get his number. Within three days, I had a flight, where I was staying, everything booked for three weeks. So you must have been pumped. Bro, <laughs> it, it was, I don't even know how to describe it. How, think about it. You're like 23 years old, and you're like, wait a minute, I'm going over there and I'm gonna live there for three weeks in a country that I've never been before, halfway around the world. But I'm like, you know what? What better time to do it than now? Were so you nervous? So how long into DJing was this? Like you would, how long were you, how many years were you DJing for when you started getting opportunities like this? See, I feel like I don't like to count the first day I got a turntable to call myself a so DJ. I feel like that's- the first you got booked, basically? Well, I got, you know, I got the turntables on July 7th, 2000, that exact day. And then maybe like... So you remember the day you got the turntables. Yeah, yeah, I remember the day because it was like, you know, it's, you know, when you meet a guy that meets his uh, soulmate, they remember the day, that's what happens, I guess, yeah, right? Yeah, so okay. then I, uh, I want to say I started getting my first gig, though, three months after. Uh, it was terrible, though. It was just after like, you got... So did you start out like DJing like private parties? Like the socials, because I wanted to hook up with a few girls. You know, we're all guilty yeah. of it. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, oh, I'm the DJ, blah, blah. And then, uh, you know, it just progressed. And then a friend of mine was like, oh, why don't you DJ this uh, bar? Throw a teen night. So I was like, all right, you know, we'll do that. And, and this up, was all in Queens, because you're from Queens. Yeah, Howard Beach, Queens. And then it was the next neighborhood over. That's not an Italian neighborhood, right? No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> but I have a funny story about that. By the way, too. I actually have a good one about that. So now I go to the next neighborhood over Broad Channel. My friend Rob is like, oh, come and DJ this teen night. I'll, you know, make you DJ, blah, blah. So I'm like, all right, no doubt. Ends up being like over 400 people show up. Fight breaks out. That was the end of that. So I was like, what do I do now? So I just continue on, continue on. But then, you know, it just progressed because then Scribs hooked me up with a promoter. I forgot who it was. I started DJing at 15 at Sound Factory. And I feel like all the New York guys ended up rolling through there. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Like Clutch and everybody was residents at Sound Factory. So then that started and it just progressed. You know what I'm saying? It just was like a nice evolution of getting to DJ places that a lot of the guys that are in it didn't get it to see. But me being so young and having a few little connections, I guess it worked. Yep. You know, it was a great time to be coming up. Yeah, I mean, because that time Serato was just coming out, but I still have my roots of crates. Right. Where I'm fortunate enough to have that at least, you know, or that appreciation for it, you know. 
Because it was a different time. I mean, it was a different feel. It was yeah. What do you like better? You like DJing with crates or I don't, like DJing I, in Serato? I don't know, man. I feel like it's like, you know, like if back then my parents loved Jimi Hendrix and then next was disco, I mean, and their parents didn't like it. Yeah. So, I mean, really, is it all that bad, I guess? I don't know. It's just. You ever tour the vinyl on the turntables when you're home? No, nah, not really anymore. It's yeah. just more opening up like a Cubase or a Logic now. You know what I'm saying? Because I want to create the sound that someone samples. And now, if you have a choice to play, obviously you play with Serato. So if you're playing Serato, do you um, do you prefer to play with the CDJs as opposed to the turntables? To or be it honest, matter? I, so when I was younger, Riz says to me, if they give you a belt drive turntable, you play. So to me, it's really just whatever you got, Let's just go with it. You know, like there's times when I'm with Scribs and he'll be playing on Tractor and I got to play on Tractor. I just have to know everything. I'm a nerd when it comes to that, I feel like, you know, and it's not like I have to be like, oh, I have to play on this or I have to play on that. It's just, it's more fun being adventurous. You know what I'm saying? Like not having your set up there because now you're going to, you may do something that might be a glorified mistake, you know? So to me, it's, I'm not so much into the, oh, I have to do this on a CDJ or a you know, whatever they give you. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, it's just, it's fun to have the unknown still, you know? Yeah. Because yeah, a, a lot of people prefer, a lot of DJs that used to play on turntables, at least house music DJs, prefer now to play on, like, CDJs. Yeah, but I remember I was walking into, like, uh, I think it was Duet, was it? What was yeah, it, yeah, Manhattan? Duet. Duet, I was there every week. And they had the turntables on the rubber band. So I loved that because I was like, oh, this is cool. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I had a little bit of that. So Were you that like a napkins guy rolling napkins, up the napkins? Napkins, yep, absolutely. And then it was like, you know, that's the problem, though, because now you have new problems where back in the day it was like, oh, the tonons broke. You know, like, all right, you know, get the needle out, lick it, you know, that type of thing. Like, there's no more of that really anymore. Nope. You know, it's just, all right, the RCA broke. Or the vibration. Oh, you can't use the napkins because yeah. it's causing yeah, the speakers to absolutely. vibrate. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. You know, so then it's, you'd be really screwed. Oh. The turntable would be some places they didn't have the rubber bands as tight, and those things would be going all, <laughs> all over, over the place. All over. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But yeah, no, so it's just really just play on whatever. Just have a good time with it. I'm not really like so serious about it, you know? So as a DJ coming up, you know, like obviously when, when everybody first starts DJing, you know, and you're, you're learning how to play music, like when did it first click with you with regards to like programming? You know, because that's like a big thing. You know, like a lot of DJs starting out, um, you know, you learn how to mix. And then, like, you're playing these parties. I remember the two first records I learned how to mix, by the so way. So do I. What are they? Jungle Jazz and Daje, You Got Me Up. Wow. Yep, two records I caught. It was actually in Vinnie Monty's basement. And what was that feeling like? It was great. I, I, mixed, like, them, I mixed them for, like, the next four or five hours. Actually, I mixed them for the next four or five days. And I just, that's, that's it. the best though. That, 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 that that's feeling, it just hits you. It, yes. it, it's like, oh my God, it locked. Yep. Like you the realize sync when you that everybody wait, uses now, right? Where do you, like you realize where you throw the record in. Yeah, yeah. it was like, just like. That's it? That's it, finally, I got it. But then yeah. you go to the next record and you're like, oh shit. You know, you're like, and then it was like yeah. holding the record <laughs> yeah. on though, right? That was yeah. the whole. You're holding the, the, the mix. Because I mean, it's obviously it's so much harder mm -hmm. with vinyl and techniques to keep the pitch on. So that was always a challenge, right? Absolutely, you know? because of the drifting. It was just like, all right, you know, you gotta kinda like become one with it, you know? And that was the whole, that was the real dopeness of it. But you so started on 1200s. Started on Newmark. Meanwhile, that's fucked up, right? That like brother-in-law DJ Scribble and he gets me Newmarks. I'm like, dude, what you is this? You know why he did that? Yeah, because now mix, I get it. Now I get it, but then I was mark. mad. I handed him like 500 cash. I was like, why am I even whipping out 500? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, what? why would I even do that? Because he knows if you, if yeah, you can mix I had a on sure he had no, than, but I'm sure he had more than one set of turntables. Oh, he did, and yeah. I tried very hard to rob him. But <laughs> it didn't work. I was just not a good thief. We're, we're going to bust his chops when he's on oh, the show. Oh, I now. can't wait for that one. Oh, my God. <laughs> this story is that one. So when, when did it click? Like, you know, you're playing, and when, when were you realizing, all right, this is what I need to do, this is how I have to play my music? Like, how did that come about? Uh, I, I, I want to say maybe 10 years in, because I feel like I follow the rule of the Chinese. They say 10 years, you become a professional after 10,000 hours, or 10 years, whatever comes first. 
And to me, it was like, that's, that's outliers, when I- Outliers, right? Outliers? Did you I, get that I from think outliers? so, I yeah, think yeah, so, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Good, you caught it. No one has ever caught it. Shit. I didn't even know what outliers Damn it. Was. Out, Damn no, it. but that's good, man. I read that So book. now, um, so basically it was just like, all right, you know, 10 years in, I want to say, I started really picking up the residencies and stuff where every week you could start judging different types of people. You know what I'm saying? Like reading the body language. You're almost becoming like a psychiatrist to them on their everyday problems. You know what I'm saying? To catch that vibe. You know, so that's when I really started to like get, you know, familiar with the whole connecting with them type of thing. So I, you know, I, I feel the same way. Right? I feel like 10 years in, like I really really understood it it's it's like crazy because you thought you understood it a year in yes but then now 20 years later you're like no at a, i'm not being pinpointing but you know and you know and you know where i really got it like when i went to go hear danny tenaglia play for the first time <laughs> hearing that guy play then was, you're like wow this guy knows what he's doing yeah absolutely but what's even crazier is that, so now I get the turntables, not to steer back to me. But, yeah, yeah, no, 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 it's uh, your show. <laughs> Come on. But so now, when I was 13 and I got the turntables, I was like, all right, now I have to go and do the atypical, go work at a music store. So I went on the boulevard at the local record shop or whatever you want to call it at the time with CDs. He had a little section for vinyl, which I was very upset about. But this is when I started researching about DJs, you know, because he was a mobile DJ that owned the store. And then he told me about the Paradise Garage and Danny and all the anniversary CDs were coming out. I even think like- What was John the name of the store? Music Station or Nation. He switched, I think. And this was on Cross Bay Boulevard? Yep. So then he would show me all these things. Like I forget at the time the Paradise Garage came out with like a, uh, some type of anniversary book or CD, I can't really remember. Or it was a vinyl, but it was like a book too. Okay. And I, every day, dude, I was in that book trying to learn and learn and learn. And I think Google just came out and I was doing that too. And it was just like, what are these guys doing? When I learned about Larry's fucking, uh, what did he have that? Uh, the real to real? No, the, um, the DJ booth was customized where all the vinyl was in that thing that he would swing. Okay. He would like, it was uh, so that he could get to like the other side of the crates, you know, it wasn't like stacked up. So stuff like that. And I was just like, wow, man. And then how people talk about how he would, you know, I guess take you on a journey type of thing. But that's what he did. Did you ever watch that documentary about West End Records? Definitely got to catch oh, that. Now my night's done. So you gotta catch what, that. What, what is this? <laughs> so it's, it's, it revolves around West End Records and that whole era of disco music and the Paradise Garage and how they turn, how they were like hand in hand, yeah. talked about Vinyl Mania, oh. people going to Paradise Garage the next morning, lining up at Vinyl Mania because Larry played cer a certain record, yeah. you can't watch it. I gotta definitely check that, but that's what it is, man, and that's what we're all mad about, is that when Larry or whoever it would be, Jonathan or whoever, would play that one record. You know, like I, I would hear stories from my sister about uh, Junior Vasquez playing peace train and I'm like I could never understand that yeah. you know like what what was going on then yeah. what was in the air then and it was that it wasn't available that's really what it was and that's the problem that we're never going to get back right that's what it is because everything is instant so and we have to embrace that and figure out a way to change it and teach people that you can't just get it now you know, that's really what it comes down to. So that's probably why you got into production. Exactly. And that's why I do the bootlegs, because <laughs> I feel that I'm not working hard enough if I'm just playing a record that I just downloaded. I feel like when I used to go shopping for Scribs or just go for me, going to Beach Street and getting records. You know what I'm saying? There was a fucking, like, a thing about that. You know what I'm saying? Like, when you got it, or well, better yet, I mean, I was fortunate enough to have Scribs where I would get exclusive records, you know, like the owner would keep it under, you know what I'm saying? That no one got. They were imports or whatever it was. Like if Tiesto came out with, I think it was uh, Rain Down On Me, that record fucked me up. When that came out and he was at Crowbar or something, I'll never forget that. I was like 15 in the club, like I'm committing a crime right now, but I don't care. You know what I'm saying? But when Scribs got that record, it was like, whoa, okay, and then we would draw on it because it was important. You know what I mean? We don't have that no more. Right. We don't have it. 
you know, you could rip off YouTube, blah, blah, blah. But I don't like sounding old because I'm embracing all this now. You know yeah, what I'm I mean, saying? I, you got to. You got right? to. You have to. You have to. I don't want to be that old, you know, soul and not take this and say, all right, what are we going to do about it? I think you guys are actually doing something about it, which yeah. is dope, by the way. Just you're, you're teaching people. You know what I'm saying? You're teaching people to get into it for the right reasons rather than what we're seeing happen. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. I you think know? it's important to find out about the roots. And like how you talk about like Larry Levan and stuff like that, like everybody should know like how this, this whole thing started. If you don't, then you're not really doing it as you far know? as I'm concerned. Like the, the parties and the, and the different DJs that came up that sort of paved the way. You know, that's why it was so important for us to have Todd Terry on the show. Oh my God, forget it. That's like right there living legend. Right. And, you, and they need to know about that. Exactly. You know, because there's things that you're going to pick up on that that's when it will change. If you can change one person's mind, it will infect everyone. Yeah. That's it. That's how I believe. And that's what I do. Like, that's why I like to bootleg records, because you know what? Yeah, you could go and see any DJ play a record. <clears throat> but back when all these guys were doing it, they were doing things to these records, working the record. That's what it was. So if I could do just maybe 5% of that, I'm trying. You know what I'm saying? That's how my See, philosophy. Plus, these bootlegs are getting your name in everyone's computer. Aside from that, you know. <laughs> Aside from that, so like and every, all right, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, that, that's yeah. that's what that's no, what that's all about. what. And, and you're probably getting booked off these bootlegs also. Yeah, it's pretty. And crazy. then you have big support from big DJs that are playing your tracks, which is the best feeling ever. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? That's what it's about. You know what I'm saying? Of course, like, like so they're embracing your music. Yep. Yep. So that means Absolutely. you must be doing something right. I guess, right? So you who know, are some of the supporters that are supporting your production? I don't want to do the to name a few. I have them ready. Tiesto, Fred <laughs> LeGrand, uh, you know, Fergie, everybody, man. It's just, that's awesome. You know what I'm saying? Like where you could walk in and you already know the person because basically they got into your mind from playing something that you crafted a little bit differently than the original production. So that's cool. Yeah. You know? Yeah, of course. I mean, when other when other people are embracing your music, especially other DJs. Yeah, that's you know, it, a cool it, feeling. Of course. Especially it, a guy like Tiesto. Yes. You know yeah, that I mean? was definitely, you know, like, and then him doing the whole smile thing, and I'm like, all right, cool. Shooting yeah. the guns? <laughs> you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> you know, it's, that, that's definitely dope. But, yeah, it's just, that's how I feel like, you know, and then plus for me, I was always giving them out for free. Be, well, to the people I know, so I didn't want to, I'm not doing nothing illegal, but, you know, it was just that because I want to try to change it if I can a little bit, you know, just like you guys are doing. And it's because I'm hearing all these kids play these records into records or playing bad mashups or bootlegs, whatever we want to call them. I don't know what they are anymore. You know right, what I'm saying? Right, it's right, like right. it's my personal edit, whatever you want to call it. They're playing them wrong. They're playing them out of key. Because if that's the case, then it's like fucking uh, Freddy Got Fingered. Daddy, would you like some sausage? Every note in, in a mix. It's like, no, there is an art and a craft to this, and I want to promote that. So if you're playing that in a wedding, to a communion, to a festival, that's trying to change, you know? So at least if I could have one thing, I'd try to do something with it, you know? It, that's it, really what... It is important to play in key. I mean, we were talking about this with Finesse last week. I don't know if we were talking about it on the show or, or before the show, but, like, it, it hurts the ears when you're not playing in key. What I can't understand is that when kids play and don't hear it, and don't hear it, that's I, scary. Yes, it's weird to me. It's almost like you're a robot then, and you have no feeling, you know. And that's the problem for me. So because they're just thinking about it, and and again, this goes back to like when is it clicking? You know, they're just thinking about it as oh wait, you know, it's matched up perfectly, and it's in sync, but it sounds totally not correct but then on the other note i'm like even things that are in key may not be a hundred percent so now you have to get into the whole thing about your body feeling you know and that's what like danny and all these guys did so amazing you know like they just it, it, like sometimes things just work for a reason you know what i'm saying so it was rhythmic or whatever it would be these are the things that i feel like guys have to pay attention and do the Chinese rule. You know what I'm saying? Don't come out with something if you just did it once. You know, do it 10,000 times and then see what, what your end result is. I guarantee it'll be different. Yep. 
you know, and I think that that's what, you know, so that's my promotion and trying to give back to the whole DJ community would be, you know, like on that aspect of it. But just crazy to me because me and Finesse talk about this all the time. Well, we have fun with it now because it's like, all right, this works, this works, blah, 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 yeah. you know? So definitely it's, you know, so an important factor. So Scribs was probably the biggest influence you had getting into the DJ game. Who else was some influences? Uh, so basically I was, you know, I have a typical story, you know, the brother giving you the turntables, and then I have the untypical, which is world famous brother gives you turntables and then I meet mobile jocks and, and like producers and now everybody's teaching me from Riz, Sizz, Finesse, Anthony Acid, uh, Slinky. So I'm like walking in the room and this kid's just cutting it like, you know, and I'm just like, so you're, all you're, right. You're getting groomed by- Groomed like- By some of the best DJs. Yeah, like at that some time it was like, you know, they were ruling spring breaks and all over the country and it was just like, whoa. I didn't even understand and I'm mad I wasn't being fully observant of the time. Now I, you know, I'm like, okay, I was blessed. Yeah, when you look back, it's always Yeah, like, it's, wow. of course, we're humans, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, you don't realize until later on sure. how blessed you are, but I was just, like, fortunate enough to be groomed by all these, they're like the godfathers of New York music, you know what I'm saying? Like, and really putting it on the map, yep. you know? Like, Scribs is the first to travel the world and open up the gates of Rome and whatever else, and, you know, guys like Finesse, touring everywhere and Anthony Acid, everybody playing his record and it just was overall it was like now I'm like wow I really truly was in a time where I was just hanging and now I'm fortunate enough to say that story you know what I'm saying so you must have started off as a hip-hop DJ I don't even know what I started off as man I I, I the first records like we you remember I was mixing Oompa Loompa, that record that was in fact Oompa Oompa Doopa Dee Doo, <laughs> and Lock and Load, I think it was. Yeah, it was a blue cover. All right, and like it was house music. You know yeah. what techno? I guess they called it then, right? Yeah. You know, and I liked hip hop then because I would go and buy. I remember traveling to Staten Island. Music I asked my, factory. I don't know what it was called, and I'm mad that I don't remember that detail. But I remember seeking out Black Rob's Like Whoa on vinyl. I couldn't find it. I don't know why that record. It was just, I liked the hook. You know what I'm saying? Yep. But I just liked everything then. You know what I'm saying? And as far as I can remember, my mother would play me like the B-52s and all that stuff. Then I remember the day that I got Razor and Guido's Do It Again wow. on CD. And my mother was like, I love this song, what do you think of it? And I'm like, Ma, what? Do it again, they're talking about, and this and that, rest in peace, you know. But I was like, this is it. This is, that CD, like, just took over everything for me. It was that always was house music, you yeah. know what I'm saying? And it was just because, I guess, you know what they say, like, when the house music beats per minute, like, get your body going, you know what I'm saying? So I guess I just fell into that whole, feeling of it but that man was like it for me you know what i'm saying i play hip-hop i love it but i mean some of the new stuff is just not really yeah, like you know i mean i don't want to get into that but you know some of it we gotta got embrace yeah. it bro i do embrace <laughs> it i definitely embrace it i definitely definitely embrace it but you know it's not the same and let's not get into that because i'm sure you had everybody talk about that but yeah, it was always house music. So man. I see you doing your thing, bro. I see you all over Instagram traveling. Where's some of the places that you've been playing? Trying, man. Atlantic City last week at Wave, which was... That place is sick, right? Sick. Sick. It was like, you know, three stories high or whatever it was. And just... How often do you play out in, uh, in Atlantic City? Well, now I'm getting back because of the whole transition stuff. So, you know... Now, hopefully, it'll be more and more. You know what I'm saying? But that was definitely the start of it. But I usually travel a lot more. It was never really over here. Yep. It used to be over here, but now the traveling stuff, like, you know, going to Dubai and going overseas and all that stuff, that's where it really was living, you know? And then now I'm trying to just focus on the production because now I'm reaching the 10,000th hour. So now it's starting to roll. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. now I'm really figuring that out. So I'm like, all right. 
I'm gonna start doing this more. Now, and what more. are you using in the studio to produce? Uh, Cubase, which I just started using maybe like seven months ago, because I'm figuring out that I like this texture of it really, rather than really I started so what, out on Logic. Okay. Started out on Logic. Love Logic. You know, nice low end, but Cubase really just gives me more options while I'm in the studio. So the, I was like, all right, I got to transition. Now, Let's let's stop right there. That that's okay. like a big thing to do. I mean, here you are producing on Logic, yep. for all these years, and then yep. so that I'm assuming that part of it is probably the technical geek in you that says I got to master this yes, program now. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Well, because I was on Logic and Ableton, 25 percent of the time. But I was like, I need something that is the grand all. And I ended up playing with Cubase because Anthony Acid was like, yo. This program is gonna fuck your brain up, and you gotta learn it. And I was like, all right, I'll learn it. So I took six months, even though it's a very hard thing to do. That's what everybody says. That, because that program is pretty hard. To oh, and no, but not even that. It was hard. It was more that you have to be putting out music every 15 seconds. So what are you doing? I'm like, no, I want my quality up. I don't care. I want that quality. If and it's not that the door makes you. I'm not saying that at all, but it's the options, how to get to things quicker or, you know, again, just like finding a, someone you love, like it, it has to connect with you and Cubase just from day one, it was like, all right, that's the program that I need to be in. And, you know, now I'm really comfortable, you know, so it's just, uh, you know, I like challenges. I don't know. It's so six months, it. you mastered it. You, I don't. I know. I'm never gonna master nothing, right? I mean, huh? well, you're, you're pretty right, good you're at right. logic. Yeah, I was nasty at logic, and yeah. you know, but it just now on to the next thing. Well, really, I think I just maybe I didn't want to just learn Cubase. Maybe I'm fluffing it up a little bit. But Anthony wanted to mix my records in Cubase, so I was like, whatever we need to do, let's get into Cubase. Let's go right now. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Because that's a whole nother thing, mixing the record. It's like stressful shit. You know. You don't mix down your own records, right? I try my hardest, you know what I'm saying? And then I'll bring it to Anthony Acid and he'll be like, all right, you fuck this one up. And I'm like, all right, now I gotta, you do it, you know? Just please help me out here. This is like, because it's hard, man. You don't, it, it's another thing to add onto the list of learning, you know what of I'm course. saying? Of where course. Where now this became that, you know, where it goes hand in hand now. Because I always said like, you know, I, everyone I feel like, is like, oh, the DJ producer. But I'm like, yo, man, like, you know, the Beatles had the guitar, they had the drum. What did we have, you know, as a producer? Turntables, CDJs, that's the instrument, you know? So it's the only way to translate computer music. You know what I'm saying? You're a computer composer. So we need to figure out a way to translate it and that's it. That's it, yeah. You know, so that's how I embrace that. You know what I'm saying? So. Do you play keyboard or anything like that? No, or? I was the most unmusical guy ever. I didn't come from the musical family. I didn't I didn't have any of that. I learned off of YouTube and, you know, going to studios and learning off of all these greats that I've been around and that's how I learned. In Dubai I locked myself in the room for I think it was to get back to that, I went booked a ticket for three weeks. I ended up staying a year. Lived there in the Middle East. Wow, you lived there for one year straight. Yeah, straight. I just, I didn't come home. I was just like, I'm not leaving here. I want to go all over the Middle East. I want to learn the cultures. I want to embrace this so that I never forget it. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you stay somewhere a week, you kind of forget some of the memories, you know? But a year, you don't forget getting locked up and, you know, stuff like that. So I was just like, all right, I'm going to learn production here and learn how to control a room that's not here because that's a hard thing to do too to me so you like, were able to work every weekend though there right it was non-stop where i just would sit in the studio get a phone call all right you booked all right cool boom boom it was just constant like a whole that's cycle great. and that was a major part of my life that i'll never forget because you know you got to jump on shit. of course you got to, you know and i was just like all right i'm going to learn production I'm gonna learn how to really control a room here because these are not people that I'm familiar with. You know, of course, in New York, we have weedos and all different cultures, you know what I'm saying? And it's 
kind of easy, I guess, to, you know. Well, you know what hit know. records to play in New York. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, all right, where's the challenge at after a while? And then maybe you could, like, experiment more. Exactly. You could break you know? records. And it, it was even breaking records to experimenting in production, where, you know, I was sampling Arabic music. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I was like, wait, what am I doing? I'm a Guido from Howard Beach. And I'm sampling Arabic music. It's a major thing, you know? And that, to me, is like really what it's all about you know yeah, what i'm saying yeah. breaking your habits you know so it was pretty interesting that is interesting so talk to us about so producing cubase how do you go about creating your tracks like what do you, how you know how does that work for you you know are there certain things that inspire you i leave the door open just a little bit and hope god walks in that's what i do <laughs> i just i leave it open just a little bit but I, I guess it's just more of just going in with a good head because I find that, you know, you get frustrated, man. This business is very frustrating, you know what I'm saying? Because now, like, back when we were with vinyl, I'm not even gonna take the credit, but back when you guys and we were with vinyl a lot, it was a job, going to the record store and doing all this. Now we got another job added. So it's always balancing the system. You know what I'm saying? How I feel about it. So now we edit on production and it's like, I got to do this. Then now people can download shit instantaneously that I'm like, all right, I got to make a record every minute. You know? So it's like, I just, this is the frustration, of course. But then I go in and I'm just like, yo, man, I'm going to make whatever I got to make, you know, and just try to get better at this crap because... At the end of the day, I listen to guys like Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles, and they sat there and really worked. You know, the Beach Boys, they, they were sitting there plucking the, the string of the pianos and trying to find new sounds and stuff, and it's the same thing. We just have more resources now, so we should be able to do it. So I guess that's the path I'm trying to go on and, and find inspiration, you know? So how often would you like to put out tracks? Once a month. Now I now I'm trying to do like fifty six a year. You know what I'm saying? But that's not realistic. You yeah, know, yeah. that's what I want. But I'm trying to aim for the whole once a month rule. But it's hard. You know what I'm saying? Because you have so much to go into a record now. It's no longer just, you know, back in the day when you go to the record shop, it was just the record. There was no like you have to do marketing, you have to do videos, you have to do, uh, you know, everything that goes with it going on blogs, getting newspapers to write about it, basically. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's a hard thing. Yeah, everybody just sees the MP3, but what about everything that's under it, you know, that no one's paying attention to, that goes into a record? What about the remix game? I mean, the remix game is different today than it was 15 years ago when yeah, people were getting paid right? like, $50,000 to do a God. remix. Oh, my God. I remember when, like, Anthony and Scribs, like, did more than life, and it was like... <gasps> You know, now everybody's just doing a remix, and it's like, all right, next, next, yeah, no next. big deal. Like, no big deal. Nobody's There's being no, like, sought out to actually yeah. get paid to do a remix. Anymore. Yeah, it's 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 just a tough game. I try not to really like, you know. Of course, you do a few here and there, but I feel like the value went down. Well, there's just too many remixes coming out. Yeah, that, everyone's and, doing a remix now. And and I think that that's kind of the whole problem. You know, like it's just too much. You know, like. Remember when like Jonathan came out with Whitney Houston remix? It was like, oh my God. It was huge. There was a value there. That's how I look at it. And you nobody's know? making 12 minute records anymore. And the reason I believe that that is, because I have a theory about this, because I love the 12 minute remixes then, but now I listen to them, I'm like, ah, all right, we could have been a little bit better. Yeah, just, just a little bit. Let's stay off that one Most note. of them were like yeah. nine minutes to like 11 minutes. Oh, what do you mean? I was playing Peace Train before. You know how long it was? 13 minutes. Yeah, it was crazy. I'm like, what? On a vinyl. Yeah. The whole 13 side. 13 minutes. I'm like, are you kidding me? But I think it has to do with, I think that guys can do eight-minute records now. But no one's doing it because they're not studying the craft of making music. It's different playing music and then making music. And that's the clear line that everyone has to start embracing. That it's like, okay, let me learn. What are they doing? Why is Niles Rogers just nasty? 
what is he doing? He's improving on the spots and doing things like this one record that's coming to mind is I don't know if you guys heard of Kill the Lights by Cassidy. Oh yeah, yeah. This record is ahead right now of the new era of disco meets 2016 to me. And I forgot who did it. I'm gonna play it later because I just love it and I can't play it now. Because you, can you play know, whatever play you whatever want. you want. Exactly. So now. The, I, I forget how long it was. I think I got a, an edit from, or remix, or whatever you want to call it, a dub version from Demetrius. Um, I forget, Demetrius from Paris, is it? But he did it in eight minutes. And I'm like, yo, you know what? I'm going to play the eight minutes because there's musicalness in the whole record that will take you there. That now kids are just, you know, doing the one noters, and that's the problem. Why it has to be. A minute and 50 seconds. Because it's boring. Exactly. You can't, well, I a think human... it has a lot to do with the attention span of the listeners, too, that nowadays. Too. Yeah, it's a, it's a marriage between both, I yeah. think. But really, though, I think it has to do with the music at the, the core of it. Like, the, you know, like, when you, if I go to a wedding or something, right? Like, I'm listening to disco music and watching my parents dance to it. And I'm like, how are they listening to the 12-inch version of this uh, There Before the Grace of God? How are you listening to that for that long? But because it's changing so much, there's so much action going on musically that you're just like, there's a new thing to pay attention to. And it's the same song, you know? And I think that's the problem today. And I'm try I, I don't know if I'm right. I have no idea, but I'm gonna try to learn that to maybe change it. I don't know, I wanna make an eight minute record. I mean, nowadays you know, you're seeing house music records are, you know, six minutes and 30 seconds. You, you're getting there. You know, you're getting, you're, you're getting around that. But, na but now, you know, years ago where you would never see house music records at four minutes. Well, it has a lot to do with some of the DJs. Like, they don't have these four-hour sets anymore. Right. So even if the you record was eight minutes. Cram it. They're now they're not playing an eight minute record yep. because they don't have that time to DJ. And then the other thing too is because of the technology and how you can just extend the record on the fly, is it doesn't really matter these days. No, it doesn't. Know? So the record could be four minutes, but you, you just can catch make a it, loop and ride it. You can make it seven minutes. Yep. You know. You can, but that's why I'm excited to play here today because now I'm going to let records rock for maybe six or seven minutes. I don't know. So what do you, you have know what I'm saying? Talk to us yeah, we want to hear what. I you don't know. Play for I us. just last night I was like, all right, you know what? I'm going to do whatever I feel like doing. You know what I'm saying? It's not that I can't not play them out. I will play them out, but I want to have a little bit of fun here. Like, just us guys, you know, hanging. Let's listen to some, like, dope shit, you know? Cool, like, yeah. it may, I don't know if you like it, but I'm going to go the disco route because I just, that's where I come from. Like, that was my, when I really fell in love with We want to hear so it, man. It's just, you know, it. I'm going to probably do a lot more of the guys that, you know, started me, you know, like Chris Moody and Riz and, their uh, sick duo collab, Sid, who uh, just came out with this new record together. Um, I'll end the show with a lot of my stuff that I got coming out on Juicy with Robbie Rivera and stuff like that, uh, with Scribs. I, I basically did collabs with like everybody that I looked up to, which I'm so blessed for. That's you know what great. I'm saying? Like, and I don't think a lot of people are fortunate enough to do that, like where it's guys you look up to, hey, come in the studio, and now they look at me eye to eye, and want to do shit with me you know what i'm saying sure. and that's truly like I'm, I'm thankful for that you know well so, you're very talented in the studio thank you thank so you I, I, i'm trying I'm sure man. if you I'm, weren't as talented yeah. as you are you wouldn't be getting oh yeah they would fucking be like all right we'll <laughs> blow them off you know what i'm saying yeah. so i'm like all right cool you know all right so we're gonna take a two minute break and then we're gonna get him on the turntables and uh we're gonna hear some stuff all right ladado's coming up thank you guys thank you